Hello everyone, I'm Chris Wynn. Welcome to the Roger Report podcast in association with the Sunland Community Soup Kitchen, where due to the international break, uh, we have a rare opportunity to take a breath and take stock of where we currently stand. Uh, we can also reflect on the closure of another summer transfer window, which was also the new regime's first summer to begin putting their plan into action. Uh, so to help me reflect on the current state of play at the Stadium of Light, uh, we are graced with the presence of Time T's presenter and good friend of the Roker Report podcast, Simon O'Rourke. Welcome, Simon. Chris, it's del- I'm delighted to be here. Nice to see you. Good stuff. How are you keeping? Yeah, I'm, I'm not bad. And at this point in history, that's about the best any of us can say, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, well, obviously, we'll get into the detail of what's going on at the club at the moment. But uh, I'm interested to get your kind of view as, you know, the local media perspective, because... I mean, normally I hate international breaks. I, I can't stand international breaks. Uh, but this time I'm kind of enjoying the chance to to take a breath at the start of the season. I mean, obviously a good start helps. But but from your point of view, is it annoying from from the kind of local perspective to to have a break, or is it a good thing to have a quiet week compared to the usual schedule? Uh, I know what you're saying. This one in particular, the one that comes in early September, does my head in because it feels like. The season's just starting to get a bit of momentum and then it stops. And I do find it frustrating. But equally, I, I take your point. There's, uh, I've scrolled down a few notes uh, and there's actually quite a lot of notes about Sunderland <laughs> and um, what's happened over the past couple of months, what's happened over the past year, that kind of thing. Mm. A lot's gone on. So in that respect, I don't think it's a bad thing. From the playing perspective, I would imagine Lee Johnson and his staff would rather have just kept playing because they're on a roll. But look... They were going to be without players. They had to call off the Sheffield Wednesday game. So be it. Let's move on. Get the new people bedded in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as well, I mean, you, you just mentioned it there, obviously, you know, that, you know, we've spoken to a few journalists kind of during the the last 18 months, you know, the, the, with the pandemic hitting. And uh, I mean, in terms of keeping the coverage going, uh, where do things stand at the moment with things like, you know, press conferences and, and, you know, interviews and things like that? I mean, are things getting back to some sort of normality or is there still a lot of areas that have to be done differently. It's kind of, I don't really like the term the new normal, but I suppose Mm. that would kind of describe it. Most teams are still doing Zoom pre-match press conferences and quite a lot of them still do Zoom post-match press conferences. Although in fairness, when you get into the EFL, quite a lot of them will try and do face-to-face post-match press conferences. I think the football reporters are used to at least once a week, sometimes twice a week, going down to training grounds. Uh, I've not been near a football training ground since March 2020. Uh, I don't know when I'll get to go back to one. Uh, it, that's been genuinely strange, not being able to go down there. Obviously, from the visual media television, we rely on things like training shots and stuff like that. We've not been able to get them for the past 18 months. Now, fortunately, relationships tend to be good enough with the clubs that they'll send us little bits and bobs, which will keep us going and that kind of thing. But it's been very unusual. Uh, the Zoom experience takes a bit of getting used to, but now I must have done two, three hundred Zoom pre-match press conferences with various football managers. And it's fine. And you get to you know understand things like the raise hand function and uh, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> it's, it's OK. I think just like, like the world, you just learn to roll with the punches, I think. Yeah. D- does it not? Because obviously, you know, on, on Twitter online, when the, the club actually you know, stream the press conferences, you know, I, I kind of dip in whenever I can to, to try and watch them. Does it make your life more difficult to try and, you know, scrutinise managers and, and people? Because y- you might be brought in by the media manager for so long and you can't maybe follow up. And d- does it make your life more difficult in that sense? Yes, it does. Just the nuts and bolts of, of doing a press conference via a computer mean it is quite difficult to follow. It can be quite difficult to scrutinise. Just because, yes, you can see the person, but it's not the same as being in the room and looking at the whites of their eyes. Mm. So, yeah, it is. It, it, it's, I suppose it, it makes it a slightly more vanilla experience in some respects. But um, I don't know, the, the manager that Sunderland, or head coach, I should say, that Sunderland have got at the moment, likes to talk. So, yeah, he's been okay, certainly. Yeah, yeah, but he likes his... Uh... Likes his terms, his um, football terms that he comes out with, which I'm uh, sure people try and decipher after the game. But uh, I was taking a quick look, um, and I think this is your uh, fourth time on our pod. I don't know whether I'm right with that, but I think it's out. Uh, it, it, it rings a bell. It rings a bell. Yeah. A lot, a lot of things, a lot of things are slipping out of memory <laughs> because I'm, I'm I'm getting increasingly older, and then the world went crazy for a year and a half. Yeah. Well, actually, speaking of that, I was looking at the last time you, you joined us, which was way back in December 2019, if I've got that right. Um, so many ways it was a 
it was a different world back then. But uh, <laughs> but in terms of Sunderland on that pod, you were discussing whether or not Phil Parkinson deserved to keep his job after we dropped to the twelfth in League One after drawing it on with Blackpool, uh, which then led to the Boxing Day game against Bolton uh, when the calls came for the owners to sell up. Um, so if we kind of hold that up as a kind of rock bottom for the club, it's probably fair to say that we're talking about a, a completely different club today in, in, in this pod as we record today. Yes, it does. I have covered Sunderland for an awful long time and I hope that that is as low as they ever go. Well, ever. But mm-hmm. certainly while, while I have to cover them, that, that was a miserable time that you were talking about then um, with largely miserable football. Uh, with a manager who probably, in hindsight, should never have been given the job, which I think a lot of people thought at the time, uh, and a lot of people ultimately were proved right. It was bad. The ownership situation was absolutely toxic. And it took a while to work its way around to the situation that Sunderland finds itself in now, which is still a kind of a bit of a great unknown in some respects, but but it, it just feels like a much better place. It feels like it feels like the club's looking up again rather than just sort of wallowing in the mire of League One. Because at the point of time that you were discussing, when it when it hit that boxing day, when it hit the point where the fans were rebelling against the old ownership, it just felt like they've become a League One club. They're just mm. this is it now. Like it, it, they could be stuck here for years and years and years. And to see it have changed around to a point where I certainly feel quite positive about it now. I know a lot of journalists feel quite positive about it now. I know a lot of Sunderland fans. Most of them feel quite positive about it now. It's actually quite encouraging that it's gone that far and and climbed that many rungs back up the ladder, in terms of public opinion anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, during that time, we had um, had the little matter of the the takeover. I mean, we we were talking before about, you know, how the the media's, you know, have has had to change in terms of how how it scrutinizes people, you know, managers, and I mean, I suppose owners come under that bracket as well. I mean, do you think that <laughs> obviously going through that takeover in the in the midst of a pandemic was never the ideal situation? But do you think they maybe didn't get the scrutiny they would have had if it was kind of not in in such times as it as it came about? Yeah, I think that goes back to what we were talking about earlier that just the whole process of journalism. Has been harder, as as many people's jobs have. Quite a lot of research into who Kira Louis Dreyfus was and what well, sorry is, and you know his family background and and what he's done in his life, and and that stuff's all easy enough to do. But the nature of it means that there's there's not as yet really been a, a group media opportunity or individual media opportunities to speak to Kira Louis Dreyfus, or indeed, I I mean personally, I haven't spoken to Christian Speakman one to one either. Um, so it just those opportunities, there's been less of those opportunities because just basically getting people in a room together has been a no-no really for, yeah. for the best part of two years. So yes, I, th- I think there has been less scrutiny. And when you see little things like Juan Sartori being there at the weekend, you, you do still realise that it's, it, it's a little bit opaque, but I'm choosing certainly at the moment to kind of accentuate the positive uh, rather than anything else. Yeah, I'm, I'm, well, on that point, I mean, in terms of the the new owners and the new regime, I, I mean, you, you said you might not have kind of been to the training ground or been to the stadium like all that much, but um, I mean, do you hear from from other journalists if there's been any kind of differences behind the scenes noticed since the new owners came in? Has anything taken effect? It's kind of hard to say. You see, you speak to people, well, journalists. Let's leave it at that. What what journalists say is, well, well, you know, you speak to people and that sort of thing. The players. Like the head coach, I know that. Um, the or the majority, anyway. There'll be some who who aren't the team who probably won't be too happy with him at the moment, and that kind of thing. Behind the scenes, I know that obviously recruitment's being done in an entirely different way. It, it's kind of difficult if you're not around the place to sort of judge how that filters down to the other staff and to the playing squad. It's just different, and I, I think broadly, just to use like common sense, which I don't think that football clubs do enough, just. Something needed to be different at Sunderland, and and quite a lot is different, and mm-hmm. that's reason for encouragement. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, just going back to last season, because obviously they, they took over. Well, I think it was in January they took over, and I thought just quickly mention the the second half of last year. I mean, it, it felt to me after they took over in January that we were kind of just kind of limping towards the finish line, and 
although we were pretty safe in the top six, it, it kind of never really felt like a promotion push, you know, like it has done, you know, going back Dennis Smith, Peter Reid, Mick McCarthy. It never felt like a real serious promotion push. I mean, do you think that kind of Kirill Louis Dreyfus and Christian Speakman, do you think they just wanted to get to the summer regardless of what league we were in, just to get to work on the squad? Yes, ultimately. There was a number of different plans. There was only so much that they could do in January. Um, and I actually think that a problem that the whole club had last season was the players that were under contract. And to an extent, I think it, a lot they had to wait out a lot of contracts, so to speak, so that they could turn a page, so that they could move on, so that they could put the first three years of, of League One to an extent to one side, to kind of draw a line under it. Because there was a lot of players out of contract. There was an opportunity for a, a, a sort of a refit. And yeah, I don't don't get me wrong. Obviously, if if they got up through the playoffs, they would have been delighted and they probably would have targeted slightly different players this summer and that kind of thing. But yeah, I think there was a broad acceptance that, that, that it had to kind of play out and the chips had to fall where they were going to last season because of the nature of the squad, because of the nature of the players that were under certain contracts and that kind of thing. So I think there was always that acceptance that if it didn't happen last year, then OK, there is the chance to sort of rip that page out of the notebook and, and start with a clean page. Yeah. Um, well, actually, I mean, just on that point, like you said, I mean, it started pretty much straight after that second leg against Lincoln. I mean, releasing the likes of Josh Gowan, Conor McLaughlin, Max Power, Chris Maguire, George Dobson, Grant Ledbetter, I think probably missed a couple others off that list. But they they were all players who, who played a significant part in a season where, you know, we were in the mix for promotion, not a million miles away. So, I mean, was that, you know, straight off the bat, a, a brave decision to rip up a squad that on paper isn't isn't that far away? It was, I don't know if I call it a brave decision. It just, to me, it seemed obvious. Hmm. They they had to do it. It it was sort of, I remember I, I did a chat with uh, Phil Smith from The Echo a couple of days after they didn't get through in the playoff semi-final, and he put it well. He said it, it was it was the obvious end of a cycle. Um, it was they've tried to do it this way for three, all right, you know, two and a half of an asterisk seasons, and it hasn't worked. Because basically, if, if you're Sunderland and you're in League One, the only thing that is acceptable is to get promoted. And so for three seasons, they hadn't reached an acceptable conclusion. And they'd done that by using the same type of players they they've done horses for courses let's get players who can play at this level now there's logic to that but it just hadn't worked for Sunderland so when there came a point where they could invite some of these players into the office and say thank you very much for your efforts we're going to shake your hand and wish you good luck with the rest of your career to me rather than a brave decision that just seemed a, a complete no-brainer it just seemed obvious someone like Max Power uh who I, who I liked was is a, is a very nice guy and who I think worked hard and who I think was proud to wear the shirt of Sunderland while he was at Sunderland, I still think it was the right thing to move him and players of his ilk on because that sort of thinking, that sort of recruitment hadn't worked. It was time to move on. Yeah. yeah. I mean, was that just an early signal to everyone, you know, whether it was the media, fans, just how much change there was going to be over the summer? That was the first step. Um, I think... None of us, media, fans, shareholders, whatever, in the club. That was, a, as I said, I think it was an obvious first step. But until the second step arrived, until the recruitment and the nature of the recruitment arrived, um, I don't think you could say how different things were going to be. Because having let one load of League One experts go, they could have just gone out and signed a different load of League One experts. And they're still, by the start of the season, would have been, you know, that natural, oh, the fans are returning to grounds, a little bit of excitement. And everyone would have thought, oh, well, you know, it's going to be different. Let's see how it is. Um, but they've done it completely differently. And so now we know that they are doing things differently. When, when they let the old guard go, anything could have happened. But now we kind of know that they, they want what happens to be different. Well, yeah, I mean, talking about, I mean, like I said, it's um, uh, talking about Brave, but if you look at Ipswich, I mean, Ipswich have kind of, uh, in my eyes, looking at the players they've bought, they've kind of gone back down that route, probably even more so, you know, hitting players all of a of a kind of certain level where the, they've tried to re kind of repeat that, where they've bought League One players. Yeah, Ipswich is staggering because they've signed virtually mm. two teams. Um, yeah. they, they almost like they just, they couldn't walk past the footballer without signing them. Um, it. That's baffling. Wigan, I find quite strange. Wigan getting the band back together and 
<laughs> reassembling a Sunderland side that had failed to get promoted for three seasons is also, to me, seems slightly strange. I know they've brought in different players as well, and they have brought in players with experience. They're going to be an interesting team, and I imagine they'll be up there. But still, I don't know. Just ha- having having watched Sunderland do it for three brackets, two and a half seasons, sometimes you get lucky and it works. If, if you put experienced, older heads together, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and it's just... I don't know. It was. I'm glad. They, I'm just glad they're not doing it again. I'm glad I'm not ha- going to cover Sunderland doing the same thing again this season because it yeah. would have been boring. Um, I think what what we're faced with now is may, maybe a lot of things, but I don't think it's going to be boring. Yeah. Well, well, let's go through the business, um, and I'll I'll try and start from the back and and move through it. But um, the goalkeeping department, uh, the acquisition of Thorben Hoffman for Bayern Munich on a season long loan, uh, with a, per- a view to a permanent move in the summer. Uh, he's 22 years old. Um, there's been quite a bit of speculation about us bringing in a keeper over the summer, including the links with Vito Minone, um, which were uh, widely reported. Um, and we've got, you know, Lee Burge, experienced League One goalkeeper, Anthony Patterson, who was battling out with uh, Lee Burge to, you know, at the start of the season. Were you surprised that we brought in another goalkeeper, considering it looked like those two were going to battle it out this season? Uh, pleasantly surprised. Um, I don't know if I'd say surprised. It, it was always a position that I thought they might look at, especially when I saw the way that they were doing business and the, and the players they were trying to bring in. It looked, it did look like they were sort of making conscious efforts to upgrade rather than replace. And mm. as you say, I, the older I get, I don't, I don't particularly like or, or think it's a, a useful thing to sort of slag off players individually mm. or anything like that. Because somebody once said to me about professional footballers, don't, don't underestimate how good you've got to be to be a bad footballer. And so looking at the goalkeepers, yes, Lee, Lee Burge is, a, is an absolutely fine average League One goalkeeper. He had a bad moment in the playoff semi-final, although he was sold short with a back pass. But there are goals that Lee Burge concedes that you think a better goalkeeper might not concede. Therefore, I was encouraged by them bringing somebody in who they clearly think is going to be an upgrade. And with the age range of players they're bringing in, if they bring in a 22-year-old goalkeeper from the Bayern Munich system, they're clearly going to play him as well. So they obviously consider him to be an upgrade. Um, and it's encouraging that the club's thinking like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think my biggest surprise was um, thinking about Anthony Patterson because, you know, he's looked like he's, you know, he's made progress over the last year or so. Um, he's only a, a year younger than, than Hoffman, but he could really do with, with getting regular first team football. So where do you think that maybe leaves Anthony Patterson? Yeah, I wonder about that. Um, I mean, I'm sure I'm not the only person who, when the, the Hoffman story emerged and it became clear that that was going to happen, I, I kind of almost expected a lone move for Anthony Patterson um, on deadline day. I'm sure if, they, if there's no way of engineering a move out for him before January, they'll probably get him out in January. I know people like him within the club. They think he's very promising. Having seen him play for the first team, very good shot stopper. Um, whether he was quite ready to be... Sunderland's first choice goalkeeper I'm not sure um, I think a lone move would, would be completely a benefit yeah a bit, a bit surprised it hasn't happened yet let's see I, I think that's the logical next step for Andy Patterson who's you know good luck to him yeah yeah it'd be good if you got some first team football and see see how we came on but uh, the other one at the back who I wanted to, to mention straight away is uh, an unexpected uh, Rolls Royce at the back uh, Callum Doyle um, I just can't believe the lad's only 17. But I think when he was brought in, everyone thought, oh, well, you know, another centre half to set on the bench. Or, you know, you know, where's the where's these first team centre halves that's going to come in and, you know, play alongside Flanagan or Bailey Wright or, and all this sort of stuff. But uh, but 17 years old and he's come along and he's one of the best centre halves I've seen in, in a Sunderland strip for years. But I mean, just just to find someone of that ability and potential from a club like Manchester City and then persuade them to trust us <laughs> with that player says a lot about the, the recruitment team of that, that, we've, that we've got in place. It does, yes. Uh, let's speak about Doyle, but because you mentioned the age, I think it, it's worth pointing out they've signed 17-year-old, I think two 19-year-olds, a 20-year-old, two 20-year-olds, a 21-year-old, a 22-year-old and a 23-year-old. So, I mean, that shows where it's going. But to, to speak about Doyle, because I think he's worth speaking about, that's an old head on young shoulders. That's an international footballer waiting to happen. Absolutely. I, I was very encouraged for, for, for various reasons. The, the the game against Wickham was the first one that I've got to at the Stadium of Light in person this season. Um, I really enjoyed it. And one of the things I enjoyed was watching the way that 
Flanagan never stops talking to Doyle. Never, ever stops talking. I mean, Doyle must wake up in his sleep and hear Tom Flanagan's mm. voice. He, he just never stops talking to him through the game, which is very important. But what he does, he's a, he's a, Doyle is a just a, a lovely, lovely player. He can pass the ball well. His ta- the time of his tackles is excellent. Um, I think, for me, the very encouraging thing about him being so young is that Sunderland presumably would have a good chance of keeping him next season as well. Now, let's be realistic. I think you're talking about somebody who could go, go on to be a, a, a very, very, very good footballer. Probably his long-term future isn't going to be at Sunderland. But he's that young that if he's successful and gets games this year, why wouldn't Manchester City look at it in the summer if Sunderland ask again and say, well, be it in the Championship, you know, brackets hopefully, or, or in League One again, leave him there, let him play another season. So I, I think there is the potential for him to be at least a, a, a decent two-year acquisition for Sunderland. And yeah, he's a pleasure to watch, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, it reminds me uh, a lot of um, first time I saw Johnny Evans. Um, he's just got yeah, that, yeah. I think that's fair. Yeah, just got that composure and just looks older than he actually is because I think Johnny Evans was only nineteen or something when he came. But yeah, it's an interesting one that with the the the, the possibility of a two year thing. You wouldn't be surprised if conversations have already, you know, even in the initial negotiations went on to say if we go up this season, then you know, it turns into a two year loan where he he progresses with us. Um, to kind of to kind of move up the leagues, but uh, but fingers crossed yeah. on that one. But um, like you said, I mean th- those young players. I mean D- Dennis Sergan, like I said, nineteen. Niall Huggins, twenty year old from Leeds. But the, the these these two aren't on loans. Um, joining the club permanently. Um, and again, I mean these two, like you were just talking about before with the ages, they kind of sum up where I think this recruitment team is focused when compared to the previous years, which we've talked about. Uh, two young players, highly rated, coming in on deals where it looks like we're getting them for a kind of a, a low sum initially, but it's based on how we perform as a club and how they perform. But it, it's it's this, like you said, it's it's young, quick, athletic players, big potential. Um, and I just haven't seen Sunderland do that for a long time. Yeah, that's the thing. It's it's a much more healthy way for Sunderland to try and move up because buying or loaning players and then maybe buyback clauses, etc., that kind of thing. Um, hopefully, these players progress. They progress with Sunderland, hopefully. But if some of them progress enough, then they will have obvious resale value. Um, they're, they're also, uh, Jamie McAllister, the assistant head coach, said after the game on uh, Saturday that he says they're all like little sponges. They they want to learn all the time. Um, and isn't isn't that more encouraging? Isn't that more exciting? Isn't that just more? Doesn't that make you feel better as a fan than the other way of signing Callum McFads in because you need somebody to play on the left side of defence? And he's played for a few clubs at that level. I just think it's so much healthier and nicer and a, a better way of doing it. And it it goes. To the big picture thing, which for years and years and years and years and years, all through the Ellis short reign, and you know, apart from hitting the odd decent season, the the club has never has never had a plan, or if if it's had the semblance of a plan, it's never had the courage of its convictions to actually stick to the plan. And certainly for this summer window, and we'll discuss what might happen next, I'm sure after this. But certainly for this summer window, they've got a plan and they've stuck to it. Now they've got to have the, the courage of their convictions to stick with it long term and stick with it for the season. And if results suddenly turn down, still stick with the plan. Yeah, yeah. And but but as I was saying as well, I mean not just not just the age of the players, but the but the type of players we're bring it in. Because I I mean, again, I haven't seen us for a for a long time bring in players who are quick, athletic, you know, get up and down the pitch. I mean uh, we've been crying out for pace for for how many years? And this is the first recruitment team that I've actually said, identified the fact that we need pace in the side. Brilliant, isn't it? Absolutely yeah. brilliant. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. For years and years and years, pace, there's no one who, nobody can run fast. Again, goes back to that thing I said earlier about common sense. See, well, we haven't got anyone, you know, this is this is me speaking as the recruitment team. <laughs> we haven't got anybody who can run fast. Let's go out and find some people who can run fast. Yeah. Um, yes, it's, it, it's common sense, but it's refreshing. It's good to see. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's go on to the, the kind of other end of the spectrum a little bit. And a couple of the older heads were brought in in midfield. Um, 30 year old Corey Evans. Um, I mean, he's brought in, and I know he picked up an injury early on, but the, the kind of the games he did play in um, before he picked up that knock, 
Um, I think he's going to be a big player for, for Sunderland this season. He looked like that old head we need in the middle. Um, you know, didn't give the ball away, kept, you know, kept hold of it, always seemed to be in the right place at the right time. And and I think, you know, we're talking about the young players and obviously we're excited about those young players, but but he could be a big signing for us this season. Yes, of course. It can't just be young players. You can't just throw a team of young players out there. Now, many years ago, Alan Hansen exploded the myth that you can't win anything <laughs> with young players because, of course, Manchester United's class of 92 went on and won the league title. But they, it wasn't all young players. They had old heads in there as well. Suddenly need a couple of old heads. Now, with people like Grant Ledbitter having moved on um, and Max Power to an extent, then yes, it makes sense to have an older head who knows what they're doing in the middle of the park, certainly. That's good. And obviously they've brought in people like Alex Pritchard, who's no spring chicken. They've they, they re-signed Aidan McGeady. That's good. Yes, you do need people like that. Um, bringing... Get, getting Luke 09 to re-sign is good as well. And I think having cleared out some of the older senior players, it gives Luke 09 the opportunity to kind of have a, have a leadership role as well. And I can't think of anybody better to have a leadership role and set examples than him. But yeah, Corey Evans, a little bit worried. If you look at his fitness record, that is a concern over recent mm-hmm. years. Um, and I agree with you. He could be a very important player, but sort of, on the pitch and and as a sort of a culture setter off the pitch as well. Yes, I think it, it kind of leads on to another point in that um, in the current formation, if, if it's sort of two deeper lying midfielders, there's going to be a lot of competition to get in that too because from on the evidence of Saturday, there's one player who just needs to keep playing and playing and playing and playing and playing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'll definitely come back on to... Um, well, a couple of those players, but uh, certainly one of them, as you mentioned there. But uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, like I said the other one was um, the other older head, I suppose, was uh, Alex Pritchard, um, who obviously you know eleven was it eleven million a couple of years ago, big reputation. You know, he, he was kind of flying a couple of years ago. Obviously, um, he's ended up at Sunderland, and you know things didn't quite go well for him. A couple of injuries, um, and he's one that you know when he when he signed for us in the summer, I thought, well, big name big possibilities and considering how well we're doing we still haven't seen him yet so he's he's another one to watch as the season goes on yeah i mean clearly uh, he's been he's been a high level footballer also clearly i think he's what you might call a bit of a reclamation project um i think it's it's very unfortunate for him that he was carrying an injury and then contracted covid which sort mm. of put him put him back a bit because it's the it's the when you're joining a club it's the worst thing that can happen to you is to not be with the players, not be with the coaching staff, not in, in that pre-season period, because he was signed actually reasonably early, but you know, he missed quite a bit of time, missed a lot, missed a lot of friendly time. So it hope you'd hope there's a lot more to come from him. And you look at his footballing CV, as you said, a lot of money's changed hands for Alex Pritchard in, in the not too distant past. You'd hope that he's got to, he's, he's got to be able to add something to add something to the squad, yes. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, add to that list, uh, Frederick Alves at the back from West Ham, Nathan Broadhead from Everton, Leon uh, Diaku, I think that's the right way of pronouncing it, I'm not quite sure, uh, from Union Berlin. Um, Broadhead's the oldest of that group at 23. Um, it means that we've managed to bring nine players in before the end of the window. Um, but it just gives Lee Johnson, I mean, I know in pre season, Lee Johnson talked about having two players at each position and you know, maybe a couple of young players to to fill out that squad. And it just looks like he's got from from suddenly, you know, at the beginning of the season where we thought, mm, is, he, is he a bit light? He's suddenly got options all over the pitch now. Yeah, uh, he'll be, I think, delighted uh, with that. That's the thing. Options, options, options. That's that's what coaches want. And you're right. And there's some very interesting ones. And Diaku, I was, I, 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 I wondered if it was Diaku, but Diaku <laughs> probably, probably sounds right. We'll, we'll see anyway. That, <laughs> That's an interesting one. I think I can understand why they wanted a player like him uh, towards the end, just just to add that extra option. And uh, hopefully he's another person who can run fast as well. Um, I think it was useful to get somebody like that. And yeah, it is. You're right. You, I'm looking. I wrote down a few in front of me, and there's 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 options pretty much everywhere. And um, I think you know. If they enjoy a drink, then Lee Johnson should be buying his recruitment his, <laughs> his recruitment stuff a, a drink or two because that that looks pretty decent. And it, but above all, just you know, we we kind of mentioned it. It's, just, it's exciting. It's different. Mm. And 
so far so good on the pitch. Yeah, yeah. We've talked about the players coming in. Couple went out on uh, transfer deadline day. Jack Diamond went back to Harrogate Town, where he was the season before last. Uh, Will Gregg moved uh, to Rotherham United for the season. Uh, very different stages of their careers, but m- both moving to get first team football for probably different reasons. But it seemed to me like you know that it was kind of um, in terms of the summer, it was kind of the last acts for the recruitment team to kind of trim the fat of Lee Johnson's squad, which I'd, I think it's been one of the big issues in previous seasons where we've ended up with players we probably ideally would have gotten out of the club, whether it's a loan for experience or players that just weren't going to be in the first team, that we seem to have been able to do this summer. Yeah, uh, I was a little surprised with Jack Diamonds because he runs mm. fast. Um, but fair enough. And uh, I do wonder whether the Elliot Embleton going to Blackpool and coming back clearly a better player experience factors into that decision. Um, look, Will Griggs is just a different thing, isn't it? I mean, that that just had, he had to move on for, for, for him, for the, for Sunderland Football Club, for, for everyone really that it's sometimes it just doesn't work and you, you've just got to move past it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was, there was talk, I think towards the end of the window when people thought, you know, he might still be around where people thought, does he get another chance? Is it is it one more chance he gets? But uh, but he finally he finally left. But uh, yeah, I think it's which is an interesting point on that. It it is a loan, isn't it? Yeah, but I think his contract's up at the end of the season. Yeah, isn't it? but the fact it's a loan means he can't play against Sunderland. Yes, yes. So maybe it's a tactical ploy to take some points off of, <laughs> off of the clubs, maybe. <laughs> but. Uh, We'll see where Rotherham are at the end of the season. So the season so far, I suppose, um, we're through the third round of the Carabao Cup and in League One, we've won four and drawn one. Sorry, we've lost one. We didn't draw one, did we? It puts us top of the league, which is probably why I'm enjoying the international break uh, for once. Um, I had a look at this uh, earlier as well. I think it's the first time we've actually topped League One, which is incredible to think it's our first fourth season in League One. And I think it's the first time we've, we've been top of the league. Yeah, uh, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I think it, it's quite important. Obviously, uh, these questions were asked uh, af- after the game against Wickham, and the the you know quite correct and understandable management answers came back of well, <laughs> the club wants to be top after forty five games, not five games. But I think it is quite important for Sunderland fans to see the club at the top of the table. Let's look. We rewind a few years. Sunderland fans, probably a lot of the local media. Uh, expected to see Sunderland at the top of the League One table all season long, spend one season there and be back in the Championship. And it hasn't worked out. I'm not even sure they've actually been second before before now, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I think I think it is just nice. It's a, it is a little a, a nice thing for Sunderland fans who who have let's be honest been long suffering to just you know see look they can get to the top of this division. Yeah. Yeah, and I was looking at last season as well. Actually, we're only um, interesting if we're only one point better off than we were last season after after five games. But I mean, the, the difference is, I mean, last season I I didn't feel confident that we had the squad and and the game plan to sustain a kind of a run last year, and it just feels different this time around. I mean, do you get that feeling from from your position, kind of in the media and people around the club, that you know things just feel different this time? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um... Interested to see what Lee Johnson does with the full pre-season, different players, different choice. His team now, um, where it, it, it's always not easy for a manager. I know he had the majority of last season, but he, he didn't have the full season. He didn't lay his full plan out and that kind of thing. So it's interesting to see what he can do. Yeah, you're right. It just it didn't it just felt a bit more of the same, even though they made a decent start last season. Um never a massive believer in Phil Parkinson, just that didn't really mm. enjoy the football that his his team played. He left, he moved on. It just felt brighter. Um, it, it, to go back to the game against Wickham, uh, I really enjoyed it. I just, I, I really like, you just go to a game of football, you want to enjoy it, you want to see, you know, fans want to see their team win. But, but I, watching it from up in the press box, I just really enjoying watching someone play football today. So, yes, that's different. Yeah. And, and actually, I mean, just on that point as well, that the enjoying it and being a different atmosphere and actually playing playing in a different way. I mean, you've got to give credit to, to Lee Johnson as well, because I mean, last season, a lot of questions were actually asked of, of Lee Johnson towards the end of last season. Uh, he was under pressure to get results at the start of this season with a squad that probably wasn't quite the, the finished article ahead of the Wigan game at the beginning of August, because um, we signed six of the nine players 
since the opening day. Um, but but he had to adapt, and um, it's it's a kind of he's got off to a great start of the season. Yes, he has. Yeah, um, I know Sunderland and, and short termism has always been a problem for years and years and years and years and years. Yeah, I, I think it was natural. Yes, some people were questioning his position after they failed to get promoted last season, and I think it, it just goes back to that thing of it, the overwhelming weight of Sunderland being in League One. Any manager who doesn't get them promoted is instantly branded a failure. OK, he didn't get them promoted last season. And to me, certainly, it, it, there seemed no logic in looking to make yet another change. Um, so it was, I think, right to sort of give him his head to have a go for the full season. You're right. He'll, I think he'll, he'll secretly be delighted and relieved that they've got off to this good start. I'm not doing him out of saying, oh, you know, you're a master track tactician and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I am patting him on the back. But equally, you're right, because a lot, a lot of the signings have come towards the end of the window. He will be delighted that they're off to a good start because now they've got that bit of momentum and now it's just easier to slot new pieces into the jigsaw yeah. when things are going well. Yeah. Uh, and, and talking about, you know, the, the football we were playing, I mean, considering that the, the style of football he was almost forced into playing last season because of the players he, he had at kind of his uh, disposal. I mean, he's done a great job to, to turn that around in the summer and get the, get the team from playing. And like you said, they had that period under Phil Parkinson where it was a, you know, a real strict kind of, you know, regimented way of playing. And suddenly they just seem like they've got they've got freedom in the pitch just to just to play. Yes, they have. And it's great to see. And you you're right. It I think there was a, a straight jacket put on the team by Parkinson, which took a long time to take off. And I'm mm-hmm. I'm not sure it ever entirely was taken off. Yeah. Which is another reason why the sort of natural wastage of players out of contract was ultimately, I think, probably a healthy thing. And a good thing. Also, I just I just think now it gives him a, an opportunity to to do it his way with players who are perhaps better suited to the way he wanted to play. The the centre forward thing is is a good example of that. I mean, Charlie White was scoring so many goals that he obviously had to play last year, and that's completely understandable. Um, but the whole the whole thing looks better with Stewart up front because. Stewart's link-up play is, 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 in my opinion, better than Charlie White's. He may not be quite the finisher Charlie White uh, is at this point, but his all-round game is excellent, and that opens up different avenues for Sunderland to attack. And it, I think it also helps the midfield coming forward as well, and he makes different sort of runs. Um, and, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's just all really encouraging. Hmm. Yeah, it, it's amazing, really, when you think about it, that... Um... A thirty-goal striker can leave the club, and not many people bat an eyelid. <laughs> yeah, I think you're exactly right with that. That's interesting. That, um, but I think it's it, it, it's kind of understandable. And you've got to be careful because you know Charlie's family are quite active on social media. Mm. Um, I'm sure you've come across that as well. Look, first of all, Charlie White scored thirty goals plus last season for Summer Football Club. That's a brilliant season for a striker. That's just straightforward, round of applause, pat on the back, fantastic. You've done your job, mate. Well done. He was also out of contract in his late 20s and that was his best season. And it was Charlie White's time to get paid. And uh, his best option for getting paid turned out to be Wigan. That's fine. Um, Sunderland, as it turns out, had his successor in-house already. But he was a certain sort of player. He he was he, all his goals were were first time finishes, mostly headers, but but you know, obviously finishes with his feet as well. He's he's quite a straight, but basically a kind of basic centre forward. But a, a good basic centre forward is still excellent. So kind of what I'm getting at is that I don't want to slag Charlie White off at all because I thought he was he was great last season. But I think a slightly different sort of centre forward leading the line makes Sunderland look. A better all-round team. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think I think you kind of you probably hit the nail on the head right at the beginning. Actually, the conversation about the strikers, where you said uh, actually the, the the conversation's probably um, less about Charlie White leaving as it is about how well Ross Stewart's doing this season and how yeah. well he's slotting into that team. Uh, absolutely, Stewart's a revelation when you you consider where he's come from. Uh, he isn't. He, he is. He's, he's he's kind of a revelation because he's. He's obviously a big unit, but he but he can run a bit. He can pass a bit. He's quite clever with his touch. He's he can obviously finish. Um, but just his his link plays really good. And um, yeah, it, it, 
he's been one of the one of the most encouraging aspects of an encouraging start to the season. Yeah, and you, you would t- again we're talking about that freedom before, and I think one of the big plus points of, of Ross Stewart is the way he he stretches the game, and he he, prov- he, he it means there's more space in midfield for for two people. I'm going to kind of bring into the conversation. Um, I think you you were touching on on Dan Neil before, um, and and Elliot Embleton as well. I mean, two players who were already at the club. We didn't kind of bring them in. They're not new signings. They feel like new signings, but Again, it just feels like it's two players, the shackles have been taken off and they've just been told to go out and play. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Elliot Hamilton's goal was joy at the weekend. I think he'll score goals as well. I mean, he, he obviously scored a very good goal at, at MK Dons as well. Um, he's he's a really clever player. Uh, I think he's the sort of player some of the fans are really going to enjoy watching. Uh, it's t- The club took a little bit of flack, understandably, from fans over... The decision to send him out on loan and then what happens to the relative clubs with Blackpool obviously outperforming Sunderland in terms of getting to the playoff final. But he kind of, it's a its a bit of a cliche, but to an extent, in football terms, he went out a boy and he looks like he's come back a man. So that's great. Uh, I really like watching him play. He's good. Dan Neal. Wow. Um, 19 years old. So it, there's, you know... I think it'll be disappointing for Sutherland fans when Manchester City sign in for £15 million pounds in two years' time. Well, by then it'll probably be £30 million, But uh, look, I don't know. It they, There's a possible future where Dan Neal becomes a very, very, very good footballer. He's, he's just got a wonderful touch. I love the way he opens his body up when he passes. Um, I love the way that, that he just effortlessly set up that third goal at the weekend. It, it wasn't the hardest assist ever, but the, the way he did it, the weight of the pass, the way he angled his run to take a defender away and open up more space for Stewart. And he just does that stuff naturally. And that, to go back to what I mentioned earlier, uh, yeah, I think Corey Evans and Luke O'Nine are both going to be very important. But if, if this guy keeps playing as he is in that position, then those two older ones are just basically battling for one place. Because to me, Dan Neal should just play. Yeah. And he should play there. And I know he's, he started the season as kind of an emergency left back, but Dan Neal should play in the middle. And if Dan Neal has a bad game, you should get Dan Neal to one side and say, Dan, you're playing next week because we believe in you. Yeah. And he could be very, very, very good indeed. Yeah, yeah. And actually, when you touched on there that um, Dan Neal slotted in at, at fullback, it it says a lot to me that, you know, when, when players do that, it just shows that they've got intelligence on the pitch. And you can see that when Dan Neal's got the ball. That he slotted in at left back, and actually, if if you just come in and watched a random game and Dan Neil was left back that day, you wouldn't have he wouldn't have looked out of place. You would have thought, well, okay, well he's the left back, and it just shows at nineteen year old he's he's got that head on his shoulders where he can he's got that intelligence around the pitch. Couldn't agree more. Says to me that he can he's coachable because they whipped him into shape to play a League One game at left back when he's played the majority of his career in centre mid. Yeah. All, all very encouraging. He will benefit from the experience of having done that. But he's a midfielder and he needs to play there. Yeah. And, um, oh, well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't know whether, probably a loaded question here, but you've probably seen quite a few players come through the, the ranks at Sunderland. If he keeps progressing like this, I mean, how far can Daniel go? Is he, is he a, has he got the look of a Premier League player in three, four years' time? I think the potential is there. It, it's difficult isn't it to sort of look ahead and you you think back to someone like Jordan Henderson and I don't know does he he, he's not physically what what Jordan Henderson was at that age but um I I don't know if some of the the passing and that is 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 very very good Mm. um look it's just exciting it's 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 been a Sunderland have done well with the academy historically over the past 10 15 20 years but it had been a while, yeah. and so it, it's it's nice to see good footballers who could become very good footballers coming coming through the system. Yeah, in in the case of Dan Neil, do you think it's going to be interesting to see the way in which because you, you were talking earlier, just play him, let him go if he has a bad game. But do you think it's going to be interesting with the way that Lee Johnson and probably Speakman and probably get involved as well? How that if he keeps on going like this, if the performances are so good, how they're actually going to manage him because. I'm not sure they'll want him to play, you know, if we play 50 games a season, if we go on in the AFL Trophy or whatever, I don't think they're going to want him to play 
that many games this season. They're not going to want him to play 40, 50 games. But it could be one to, to watch this season if he keeps doing as well as he is. Yeah, I think you, make, you raise a perfectly fair point there. He is a young player and you shouldn't overplay young players. So, yes, that's fair enough. I'm, I'm just sort of, I was bowled <laughs> over watching him at the weekend, so I'm possibly, possibly getting ahead of myself. But, yeah, you're right. He, he shouldn't play He shouldn't play too many games. Um, I think that when it comes to the EFL Trophy, to me, there's, there's always footballers in a first team squad that need games, so that's fine. And at the moment, you know, people like Aidan O'Brien have, have been playing and doing very well in the League Cup. Bailey Wright, sorry, need, needs games, that kind of thing. Um, so those sort of players, they can play. But apart from that, for me, the EFL trophy should be the under 23s, basically, mm. and should be the opportunity to rest people. In, I'll just qualify that by saying I'm not actually saying throw away the EFL trophy. But I'm saying don't go too hard at it during the group stage. And if some, if the club finds themselves in a quarterfinal or a semi-final, then you can never go at it because there's only a couple of games. But basically, I, I, don't, I don't think, by and large, I think they need to keep the senior players out of that because that that's basically that that's a that's a holiday that Sunderland's been on now and they, they don't need to go back there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the rules are this season. I know there was all sorts of rules last season where you had to play so many players are in the last game and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. But I don't, I don't know what the rules are about. Uh... Oh, I'm sure they can fiddle it to their yeah. advantage. I mean, they, 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 they're actually, they've done well so far because the League Cup's yeah. working out quite well for them um, yeah. because it, it is giving players game time. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, moving forward, I mean, I, I don't want to tempt fate, but uh, if you look at the, the fixtures in September... We've got four games, uh, three of them at home against Accrington, Bolton and Cheltenham, one away against Fleetwood. Um, I mean, on paper, it provides a fantastic opportunity at the beginning of the season to be leading from the front with nine games of the season under our belt. Yeah, absolutely. And the good thing for the players and the fans is that it can be approached with a lot, quite a lot of confidence, I think, as well. Um, I, I think you're right. When you, It's just the start of September and it's best to try not to get carried away. It's best to <laughs> tr- treat it with a bit of caution, perhaps especially with a squad where there are a lot of young players, because there, there will probably be days where it just doesn't quite work out, where, where inexplicably a group of young players just don't quite make it work on that day. There'll probably be the odd League One game, especially away from the Stadium of Light, where a team featuring a lot of young players gets bullied and yeah. probably ends up maybe losing, that kind of thing. Um, I don't think it will be a straightforward upward line on the graph, but it's very, very encouraging so far. And you're right about the fixtures. There are games there which look like games to be won, so to speak. And hopefully, whatever team Lee Johnson picks can can go out and win them. But just to say, it's too early to get carried away. It's been a very, very encouraging start. I think it is nice for some of the fans to see their team at the top of the table. But it's very early days and there are teams that have brought in a lot of players in this division. There's teams like Sheffield Wednesday who you just think naturally are going to be up there. There's, I mean, surely with all the signings they've got, Ipswich eventually will find a way to be <laughs> decent. Wigan are going to be decent. There's a group of them. There's, there's eight or nine, yeah. 10, 11, 12 even, who you could look at and think, well, you could make a case of them being at least near the playoffs. I don't think it's going to be straightforward. There's time, like on Saturday, there's times you think, I wonder, is this team just going to absolutely whip the ass of this division? <laughs> and, you, and and it's it's nice to have those daydreams, but the probability, and especially, look, it's Sunderland, isn't it? Typical Sunderland. Yeah. It's unlikely to be a 12-month coronation. But um, look, they, they look good. They, they, I, think, I think it's already pretty safe to say that it's going to be another season where Sunderland will be towards the top of the League One table and challenging for promotion. Yeah, uh, yeah, and a couple of lines you said there. That I'm sure you know the thought you had. I'm sure there's you know plenty of fans in the stadium thinking, yeah, you know that this is looking good. Inevitably, that's going to raise the expectation. But do you think the way that the recruitment team have done it, with the age of the squad, with the the potential of the squad, maybe you know if a couple of results don't quite go to plan. They've maybe got a bit of grace there where the, the fans think, well, OK, expectation's high, but, you know, these are young lads and they're, they're, they're having a go. 
Yeah, that's another good point. Yeah, I think it does insulate you a little bit from public opinion when you, you're doing something as different as this. And I think football fans like the idea of young players as well. They're, they're sort of, because it does sort of just naturally lead you to ideas of brighter, better futures. And so, yeah, I think it probably does insulate them a little bit. And also, I think if if and when bumps in the road occur, that's when you need the Corey Evanses and the mm. Pritchards and the McGeevies and, and the Tom Flanagans and, and the Bailey Wright. Yeah, yeah. And I, I also think um, something we haven't had for, for quite a while, actually, the, we talked about Dan Neal and Elliot Embleton, but obviously local lads as well. I think that might help them as well. You know, sometimes you see... You see, sometimes a younger player sometimes taking a little bit of stick, maybe when it's, it's a little bit unfair. But uh, I'm sure the fans, you know, a couple of local players in there, that the fans are going to be right behind them. We haven't had it for a while. Yeah, no, it's good. It, 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 everything's there, isn't it? Because it, it's a, it's another it's another thing. Lee Johnson is is no one's fool, and he he, he will know this as well as anyone as well. The in brackets one of our own factor is another nice card that yeah. that is there to play. And you're right, it's probably another little bit of insulation against criticism if times turn a bit harder later in the season. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, well, like I said, you know, all good on paper, top of the league, good transfer window. So I suppose I have to ask the question, is is this the year that we're going to get out of League One, Tom? Um, I hope so. <laughs> I really, I really, really hope so. I'm, I'm so encouraged by what I've seen so far. I'm really enjoying the way that it's, doesn't almost feel like Sunderland because it, it feels like they've, they've got a bit of a plan and they're going to try and stick to it. The football has been easy on the eye so far. Yeah, I think this might be the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Five games into the season. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. It, it 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 might well be. I like I like the you know. I mean, Loch Ness Drogba. That's a great nickname. You know, you want you want you want the team to be promoted just so that nickname goes down in the history books. <laughs> yeah, it's look, it's been it's been really encouraging. Um, hopefully, put it that way. It, it, it kind of got a, a good feeling about it at this stage. A better feeling than I had at this stage last season. Yeah, yeah, it, it's interesting. You know, the, the I've I've seen that reaction so many times. You know, when you have conversations with you know friends or whatever, that nobody wants to shout it from the rooftops, but everyone wants to see it, and everyone's thinking it. It's it's just a different feeling, and. Uh, Hopefully, uh, hopefully that will continue. Um, I mean, just out of interest, we've got Agnew up next, and we've got, like I say, we've got three home games this this month. Are you, are you planning on getting along to to one or? Oh one yeah, or? I'll 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 try and get along to to as many as I can. But obviously, in, in my job, I cover Newcastle United, Middlesbrough, all the other clubs, yeah. and all different sports as well. So um, I, I I go around the region, and it's it's always a privilege to go go to different games. But hmm. it yeah yeah it's um, I, I'll certainly be going back. Uh, as much as I can because I, I as I say I really enjoyed that Wickham game on Saturday and I enjoyed I just enjoyed watching them it was it was good I enjoyed the way they played football so yeah um, it, it, again so long with Sunderland watching watching and covering Sunderland that it, there is the, just that, that natural point of worry where yeah. you, you look at it and you think that, so the, the, the next game's Accrington at home and you think well clearly that's an obvious three points you think something's bound to go wrong isn't it <laughs> yeah yeah, I've had this conversation with my brother multiple times when even when we're three nil up, four nil up, you think, you know, this it hasn't finished yet. <laughs> Something could still go wrong. But uh But look, just on the just on the typical Sunderland thing, ultimately it ended up typical Sunderland last season in the playoffs. Mm. But before that, they'd actually done a couple of things that weren't typical Sunderland. They they'd won a match at Wembley, albeit sadly without the spectators being there. Uh, that was a strange day, by the way. Um, <laughs> I, I was lucky enough to be there, and it, wow, wow, that was so strange. Um, and they beat the Joey Barton team, you know, mm. uh, th- things like that. They, they they did a couple of things that Sunderland don't normally do. They they were winning games, midweek games that under Phil Parkinson you absolutely could guarantee were one one draws. Yeah. And Yes, they ultimately didn't get where they wanted to go, but it, it looked like they were taking their first steps towards not being typical Sunderland last season. Maybe they can take the final steps towards that this season. Good stuff. Well, you heard it here first. Uh, Sam Norrock says we're <laughs> going to get promoted. <laughs> we'll hold you to that. <laughs> well, on that note, I just want to say thank you very much, Simon. It's been a pleasure. Um, really enjoyed the chance to catch up. 
Yeah, I've enjoyed the conversation. Rogue Report doing a great job. Great podcast. I enjoy listening to them. People should listen to them. I, I like the way that the, the sort of fan culture is going at the moment. And uh, yeah, I've really enjoyed it. Cheers. Good stuff. Thanks, Simon. And uh, thanks again, everyone, for listening. Uh, keep a look out at Rogue Report for all the build-up ahead of the next game against Accrington. But uh, from us, it's bye for now.